What's up guys, Mate here. I think it's the 20th time that I introduce myself because I fucked up all of them before. So it's the fourth part of build your own synthesizer. And uh, yeah, in this part, I will show you how to make the step LEDs work and how you can code your tiny code snippet in order to make the lights uh, light up after each other. So first of all, I would like to explain to you how the breadboard works. So here you have the so-called power rays on this side and also on this side and what they actually do is they just extend the ground pin here and the power pin so the negative and the positive one because if you would let's say have to connect every LED to the ground pin what you are really going to need it would be a pain in the ass to connect everything to the same pin you know so at some point you would have so many cables going through the same hole that it just wouldn't work and that's where the power rail comes into the game and uh, you just connect the ground pin to the negative part of the power rail and by doing so you have access to the ground pin all over the ground rail so you could do the same thing with for the positive one too but you don't need it because you get it already from the usb from here so I have a pretty much destroyed breadboard here, but it's really, really nice to explain to you how it actually works like. You can also see even the holes on the other side here. And uh, some of the strips are missing, but it's perfect for us for the explanation. So you can imagine that you want to connect one of the LEDs with three other cables because the cables are going to point B and you really have to have the connection between the long leg of the LED with this point B. And what you could do of course is to solder everything together and just pull all of the cables and, and insert them to point B. But it would be really nasty and a pain in the ass. So let's say you want to just try it out and maybe it's not going to work the way you want. So then you want to undo it again so it's not going to be a common C version but uh, here it pretty much is so you can undo your stuff if you didn't like it because you can just insert one of the legs in this hole and you're going to have several other holes where you can put in your other cables and once you did that they are all connected so they can communicate via electrical current and that's what you want to do. So let's say you want to connect one of the LEDs to test it out. The first thing you are going to notice is that one of the legs is longer and the reason for that is that the long leg is the positive one, the positive lead, and the short one is the negative one. There are also some other words for that, so the long one would be the hot one and the short one would be cold. So you can remember it by thinking about your dick which gets really short in the winter because it's cold and you have negative temperatures and I think it's a really nice way to remember it. So let's just do it for one of the LEDs. I will just insert it here or maybe a little bit more on the left side so we have more place and notice that I take the long leg on the right side. So now I'm going to take one of the jumper cables and connect the short leg, which is the negative, the cold one, and which is on the left side, to the negative part of the power rail, as you can see it here. So, left leg goes to the negative part of the power rail. And now you may ask yourself, how is it already negative or positive, the power rail? And it really isn't. So, you have to connect the ground pin, which is here, uh, at the top corner on the right and connect it to the negative side of the power rail and now I'm going to do that it's going to be a little bit tricky because the audio shield is at the bottom but you can do it here so now you can see that the ground pin is connected to the negative part of the power rail and this way the pin gets extended all the way through the rail and this is exactly what we want to, because you don't have to pull this cable to this point, to this pin, but it's enough to insert it here. So it's perfect, it makes your life a little bit easier. So now you will insert all the LEDs and have a space of one hole between them.
So once you have every LED and their short legs connected to the ground, what you're going to do is you go from the long leg from the right side, so the positive one, to digital pin 33. You can also look it up if you're not sure about the number of the digital pin on the on this paper and uh, you can also google it. I mean it's going to be a teensy 4.1 not a 4.0 but besides that it's the same. So 33 I go down and here. So now we have every digital pin from 33 to 40 connected to the positive legs of the LEDs. And uh, one thing what you may notice already is if I take the broken breadboard then you can see that the rails are not connected here. So if you have let's say the ground pin here and you connect it to this part of the power rail then it's not going to extend to this point. So what you want to do is to connect them with a jumper cable and you also need to do it from this point to this point in order to have the ground access all over the breadboard. So there are also jumper cables which look a little bit more neat. You can use them too if you don't want to have all this, I don't know, messy looking stuff here. But I have no problem with it. I, I really like them more than these because they are really just a pain in the ass to press them into your breadboard. So I don't like them. You can use them of course too. I mean, they are the same thing, just uh, feeling and looking a little bit different. So now you are ready to go from the hardware side and the last thing you want to do is to connect it to your computer. So in the next step we are going to check if our system is working. So we will just try to light up one of the LEDs. And for that we are going to do what we do all the time and include arduino.h and also we are going to create an integer called LED1 and LED1 is going to be the pin 33 so it's going to be the first pin which we connected to the first LED makes sense and now you make void setup which we do all the time so we are going to write pin mode and inside the brackets we are going to take the arguments LED1 so we do something with the LED1 here which is at the pin 33 and we are going to set it to output so that it sends signals to the LED. That's basically all you are going to need in the setup function and now you write void loop. This is going to be the function which is going to get executed all the time. And here you will just write digital write LED1 again because you, you are still talking to the, to the first LED and it's going to go high. So this just means 33, so pin 33, go to high, so turn it on. And if you're now going to upload it by clicking on this arrow at the bottom, you should see that the first LED just lights up. So now you may think to yourself, I have eight of those LEDs, so I'm going to make eight of those variables as well. So right, LED1 is 33, LED2 is 34, LED3 is 35, and so on and so forth. But it's a little bit of an unnecessary work. And the reason behind that is that you are going to use the so-called arrays. And an array is basically just a list. So you can just insert multiple values and call them whenever you want to. So you can create an array by naming its type. So is it going to be an integer, a boolean or any kind of other variable? In our case it's going to be integer. So we write int just like before and then LED and those squared brackets. And now you're going to write equals to. Then you take the curly brackets and write 33, 34, 5, done, done. And don't forget the semicolon. So you see it's a little bit neater so you don't have eight lines of code and you can call them much more easily. So in the setup function we will write serial begin 38400 so it's the baud rate. So 
Now you are going to do the same thing what you just did before for the pin mode, but you will notice that you should do it eight times. And that would mean that you write pin mode LED and the squared bracket zero and then output. So you may ask yourself, why is it an LED and uh, a zero inside the brackets? So whatever you write inside the brackets, it's going to refer to the position. So when you talk to computers, you write zero if you mean the first step or the first place. So it's a really important thing to remember. So don't forget about it. And uh, whenever you mess up, just ask yourself, did I count? the way the computer wants to count, or did I do it my way? So the LED zero would be basically 33, and LED one would be 34, and so on and so forth. So of course you could do it this way. And basically do it all by yourself and write da 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 da. But it's a little bit of a slave work, so you really don't want to do that. And uh, by the way, by pressing Alt, Shift and F, you can tidy up your code. So I do it all the time. So if you just go back to this point, then you press it and bam, it's clean. So instead of that, I'm going to show you something which is a little bit more sophisticated. And it's going to be the introduction of the for loop. So let me write the for loop first and then I'm going to explain it to you. So what do we have here and how do you read it? Because it looks a little bit weird and there are some weird numbers and values and letters and all that kind of stuff. So what does it actually mean if you would translate it to human language? It basically means that I take an integer e and set it to zero and then I'm going to increment e, so that basically means I'm going to add one to the value of e all the time until I get to the point where this statement is not true anymore. So this, this would be the point where e gets to 8, because 8 is not smaller than 8, which makes sense. So the last number which would go through would be a 7, because 7 is smaller than 8. And every time a statement turns out to be true, so let's say for e equals to 0, which is obviously true because 0 is smaller than 8, the value for e, which is 0 in, in this case, gets into here. So it says, hey, I'm in now, I'm okay to come in, and my value is zero. So it's going to set the LED to zero, which means that pin mode for the LED zero, which is 33, is going to set the output. And then it begins again. And now it's going to be E equals one, and it does the same. So for this one, it would be LED one, and that would be 34, and it's going to set it to an output two and it will just loop through. And because the TNZ is incredibly fast, it's going to happen in like, I don't know, one millisecond or microsecond or nanosecond. And I'm not sure about that, to be honest, but it's going to be incredibly fast and you have every pin set to an output. So it's a really neat way to have it done really fast. So I will give my best to stick to a good habit and comment everything. So the array would be basically just an array of all the digital pins which are connected to the LEDs. Nice. This one would be begins the serial transmission and the for loop would be setting up all of the LEDs, the digital pins of the LEDs to output. So now we go to the next function, which we always have the loop function. And here you can really see the difference. So the setup function is going to be executed once and uh, all of the LEDs or the digital pins are going to be set to an output and it happened once and it's done. But inside the loop function, it's going to get executed all over. So the first thing what we are going to need is an if statement. And let me write first,
So one thing which you maybe already know is the delay function. Um, the delay function is pretty easy. You can insert it everywhere and let's say delay of 100 means that once you reach the point or the line where this delay function is, it's going to wait for 100 milliseconds, which would be a tenth of a second, and then it's going to go to the rest of the code. So it's going to take a small break here. And it would be perfectly fine if our main goal would be to have this um, sequentially changing LEDs. It's not a problem yet, but you really have to keep in mind that there are many things happening at the same time. So the program has to ask your rotary knobs all the time, like at which value are you? Or your buttons which turn on and off the LEDs, like what are you doing? Did did this guy press on you or did he not press on you? So should I be on and off? Should I have the pitch of plus 12 or should I not have the pitch of plus 12? And you can only get this information by looping through the whole code all the time. And you can't do it by having a delay function. You know, it would just take a break there. And uh, that's why you can't take the delay function. And that's we have to go another path. And that's why we have this if statement with this weird milli stuff. The millis function is actually a function which just counts the milliseconds once your program started. So you turn on your Teensy and you wait 10 seconds and the millis function would give you the value of 10,000 because 10 seconds are 10,000 milliseconds. And it's going to count it all the time without having to stop the whole code at this line. So you probably see now why we are going to use this version because of the reasons I already mentioned. So what does actually happen here? First of all, we have the last millis variable, which we set to zero, because if you don't give it any value, so you don't initialize it and say equals to zero, it's basically the same. So you can imagine you turn on your Teensy and you start this code. The millis function is going to begin to count immediately from the first millisecond. And the last millis is going to be at zero all the time until the millis reaches the value of 101. So we have 101 here and the last millis is still at zero. So it didn't, didn't change yet because it didn't have the chance to get inside of this if statement where it would actually change because we set it here. So it's going to be at zero. And this is the first moment where we have something what is true because 101 minus zero is 101 and it is bigger than 100. So at this point, after 101 milliseconds, it gets inside of the if statement and it says, all right, now our last millis is going to be our current millis, which would be 101. And please now also increment by one. So the step was zero before because, because we just have integer step here and it's the same idea here. We could also have equals to zero, but we just have it this way. And also the, inside the nested if statement, we have if the step is the same, that is what they mean, the double equal signs. If the step is the same as the step number, which would be eight, then jump back to step zero because you begin at zero and end at seven. So one, uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then it just says, all right, you are at eight. And now please for that value, go back to zero. So this way it's going to be at the first step again or the, at the zero position. Let me just write it back again. And you can imagine now we are at step one and now we go on. So it's counting again. And next time it's going to be true again is the point where millis gets to 202. So it makes sense, right? Because now you have the last millis 101 because it was saved before, the loop before, and it's going to add one to the step again and repeat it until it gets to the point where step is going to be eight and then it's zero again and it's going to start all over again. So it's a really, really neat way to build an internal clock without actually using the delay function, which would be a deadly sin in our case. So you really don't want to do it because it would just hold up your whole code. So let's not forget the good habits and just write the comments. So 
enters the if statement once the interval is greater than 100. Sets last millis to the current millis, which is the time measure. Please stick to this good habit and you don't have to write it the same way I write. So write it so that you can remember what you did and you will be so thankful to your past self for doing so. So we are going to use the for loop once again, which we just learned about. And uh, it's going to look the same way, like in the setup function or almost the same. So you can just copy paste it and don't forget those curly brackets here. And let me just write the code first. So in these 10 lines, everything comes together, actually what we just learned about. And here you can see the for loop once again. So it's doing the same thing like here. And inside of the for loop, we have two if statements or to be more specific, we have an if statement and we have an else statement. So let's say if I'm having a good day, then I'm going to meet my friends and else I'm not going to meet them. Pretty easy, right? So that's exactly what the code does. So if E is the same value as step, which would be, let's say zero, if we are at the first step, then it's going to enter the if statement and set the LED zero, because E is zero at this moment, to high. So it's going to turn on. And for every other value, it's going to be else for E equals one or two, three, four, five, six or seven. So except for the step value, which is in our case zero, everything is going to be set at low. So step one, two, three, four, five, six and seven. So only the first one, which would be zero, is going to set, be set at high. And that is exactly what you are going to need in order to get your step sequencer going. So one thing I didn't really understand at the beginning was how fast the value E is actually changing because it's pretty clear that the value step is going to change with the rate of 50 milliseconds because that's the interval you actually selected or typed in. But you have to know that the integer E inside of the for loop is going to get changed as fast as possible. So depending on your board, of course, and the teensy is pretty damn fast. So I don't know what's the exact rate of it, but it's really, really fast. So you can imagine your step variable here is for 50 milliseconds because of our choose interval is going to be at the same step. So let's say at step one, then after 50 milliseconds is going to go to step two. After 50 milliseconds is going to go to step three. But the thing is, because the teensy is so incredibly fast, when you are on this point or on step one, for example, E is looping through from zero to seven all the time. It does it so many times that by the time you reach step two, it did it probably a hundred times, but I don't want to say something too big, but it did it way more times than the step sequencer did it. So let's say we are at step zero with our step counter variable here and E is at zero two. Then before step zero could move to step one, E already made a whole loop and checked all the other LEDs. And for every other LED number, this statement turned out to be wrong because for E equals one, the step is not going to be at one because this guy is still at zero for two either because two is not zero either. So it's going to go to the else part of the statement all the time and say LED one, two, three, four, five, six and seven. So everything except for LED zero is going to be low. So it's going to get turned off. And you can really take your time to think about it and maybe just take a pen and a paper and write it down for some loops. It's a really helpful way to understand it. So now you can actually upload the code and uh, this is what you should see at the end. So it's looping through really nicely and uh, you can 
vary the speed by taking different intervals. So I'm going to end this lesson at this part because I think it was enough information for everyone who never coded in his life before. If you are someone who does coding all the time, it's maybe a little bit too easy for you and the ideas I'm actually using here with for and if and so on is pretty easy to you, but I want everyone to understand what I try to teach. So just let me know if you have any kind of struggles, problems, just let me know in the comments. You can also write me on, I don't know, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you want to. And I would love to help you. And yeah, you can also criticize anything you want to. I would be really happy about some comments in general. And uh, until then, I wish you a really nice day and I hope you like the video. Bye. Have a good day.